Welcome to Christian Fellowship's weekly sermon podcast. So I, I've asked our, our pastor emeritus, Dan Baracco, to speak this morning. Um, Dan has been a part of church life here for oh, since 1983 and retired just a few years ago. So uh, he, he's not been as active in the responsibilities of, of pastoring over these last few years. But um, ministers of the gospel, they, they never... They never really go away. They, they're never really done. They always have the Word of God in them. They always have something to deliver. And so I've asked Dan to come this morning and just present what God has put in his heart and to serve us with the Word of the Lord. So let's welcome Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see what the second service is like. We're normally first service people. Old people get up early. <clears throat> um... Yeah, I've been a part of the church for these 32 years in active eldership and then retired and continue to help however I can. Appreciate the time to share this morning. Um, Audrey and I will be married 50 years next week. So I want to ask Audrey to stand. Audrey uh, has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize the Medal of Valor, the Marriage Medal of Honor, the Medal of Freedom, and the U.S. Medal of Honor. So there we go. During our 40-year anniversary as a church, Phil asked me as a part of a panel, <clears throat> multi-generational panel, to explain in 60 seconds the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how important they are in the church today. I basically said that if you took a new Christian and you locked him or her in a room just with a Bible and they read it and reread it, they would not leave that room without believing in the miraculous or the supernatural. I believe you have to be taught not to believe that or it just to be, to be ignored altogether. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, when Jesus, after his death and resurrection, told his followers, I'm going to leave you to go to be with the Father, but I want you to go into Jerusalem and wait to receive power. He didn't leave them alone, and he didn't leave them powerless or comfortless. He would send the Holy Spirit. I want to talk to us this morning, uh, the Holy Spirit in us, for the common good of all. In 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, where some of the gifts are discussed, in verse 4 it says this of 1 Corinthians 12, Now there are various, a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of, of service, but the same Lord, and there are a variety, varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That's why we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, not only found in 1 uh, Corinthians 12, but also in Ephesians, and also speaks of them in Romans 12. But it's for the common good of the body, not just for our personal exercising. To one is given the spirit of utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge in accordance to the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by, by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to, other, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who appropriates, who, who appropriates to each one individually as you will. God gives out these gifts, and he gives them to, for us to be used as he desires them. Now, let's just flip over in Acts chapter 1 about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter, uh, Acts, Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says, and when the day of uh, Pentecost arrived, they were all gathered in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. 
and divided tongues as a fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. When the people were gathered at that Pentecost feast pastime, uh, Passover time, as they were gathering, this outpouring happens, and God filled the people, those 120 in that room, to speak in languages that they had never learned. Quite a miraculous uh, experience. The spiritual gifts, as Sam Storm says in his definition, the spiritual gifts are nothing less than God himself in us, energizing our souls, imparting revelation to our minds, giving power in our lives, and the working of his sovereign and gracious purposes in us and through us. This last uh, March, I was privileged to, to, uh, to speak on the gifts of the Holy Spirit found in these chapters and did all of them except the, the gift of prophecy. And uh, in, in that, we went into the depth of, uh, of those gifts. And if you'd like to know about those classes, you go to our website under resources and, and there was an audio and notes provided for, for those classes. That, better yet, under those sources uh, where it says series, go back to 2015 and Phil did several teachings on the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the spiritual gifts in the scriptures, through the entirety of the scriptures, and the Spirit's outpouring is for the common good of all the church and also those who are going to be brought into the church where his grace is yet to be revealed. It's really not up to us whether we should pursue the spiritual gifts or not. We're commanded by the Lord to pursue spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 14.1. It says, pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. The gifts that we are to pursue were God's idea. He decided to give them to the church. We are to pursue them. He gives them to us, and we're to use them for the edification of the body. And the church needs to be that safe place, that environment where uh, biblical use of the gifts are biblically used. There's a lot, of, a lot of weirdness out there, and the church needs to be that place where those gifts are properly used. could be in a Bible study or a volunteer group or a small group or in an event uh, time as we are having right now. It's the Lord who passes the gifts out for the common good of each one of us. These last several years, <clears throat> our family has been going, our family, our larger extended family has been going through a difficult time, and I've been going back and forth to South Florida to deal uh, with a lot of the issues in our family. And one of those, uh, one of those trips, uh, coming back to Columbia from Fort Lauderdale, I took a connecting flight to Dallas-Fort Worth. It was delayed, and I literally ran to the connection to, to get into Columbia. Now, when you deal with situations uh, that are exhausting, you get a bit tired, and you, you want to rest. You want to kind of clear your mind. And so when I got on that pl plane, I had these on my neck, which is the universal sign over all the world I don't want to talk to anybody, and I don't want anybody talking to me. It's not, not that it's just you're impolite, you just want quietness. I, I wasn't doing anything except actually had the, the, over my ears to, to just have it on silent just to quiet my own soul. So I ran on that connecting flight. I got on the flight, and there was someone else behind me. When we got on, the door was closed. And I went to my seat, and there was a young lady sitting in the seat next to me. It's just two on, two on each side. And so I've got them like this. And she says, I'm so glad you made the plane. I'm so glad. I was wondering who was going to be late for the plane, but they were said we were going to be waiting for the plane, and I'm glad you made it. It's so good to have you on the plane. <laughs> I'm thinking, do you see, do you see these? Uh, 
And she said, oh, I'm so glad you made it. By the way, have you ever eaten at Friday's? Friday's is really nice. It's right off of 63. It's really a good place to eat. Their cob salad is unbelievable. And she says, now, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a nervous person, picked up on that. And, uh, and she says, I, I like to talk a lot, and I'll be talking, but, you know, I'm going to break out my iPad, and I'll watch a movie. And I said, kind of praise the Lord under my breath. And, uh, and uh, so she did. She got out her, her, her iPad, and she began to watch a movie, and I put the, them the rest of the way on and, and was quiet. While we were traveling, uh, this flight was incredibly, was incredibly rough. One of the roughest I've been on on, on a plane that small. And so uh, the, the pilot's trying to reassure everybody, and she was kind of nervous. I said, it, it's going to be okay. And we were coming in kind of to our final approach, which is a phrase I don't care for on a flight. Um, <laughs> but we were coming in, and I, I noticed she was getting uncomfortable, and and I, so I was just trying to reassure her it's going to be okay. And then I looked over, and she had her hands cupped. And in her hands was evident that she had gotten sick that I didn't, I didn't see. And so she was standing there like this. And so I grabbed the bag that was in front of my seat, and I was putting it there for her to, you know, to. <laughs> and while she was getting ready to do it, she got sick again. And the plane shook, and all of that went right on my lap. <laughs> and she felt so bad. I'm so sure, sure. You know, she was still, uh, she, she felt so bad. She was apologizing, and I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And so we finally landed, and, and the, 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 the attendant on the plane was kind enough to bring us stuff. And, of course, we had to wait till everybody left, and she was... Again, so sorry for, for that and was embarrassed. And she says, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an engineer, I work for the state, and I was hoping it wasn't in nuclear. Uh, but uh, she said that, that she was so apologetic. So we were last to get off the plane and got her bag and walking to, that, to the baggage area. And, um, and I, I hear the Lord speak something to my heart. And he says, you know what? Well, he didn't say, you know what? He says, <laughs> he says, we clean up each other's messes in the church. I've lived that out so true in my own life, where I've been in, in horrible situations of, of difficulty or pain, and people, for the common good of all of us, have strengthened and helped me and instructed me. And in the church, when it comes to the things of the Holy Spirit, when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit are being in operation, it's for the common good of all of us together so we see the church grow and mature. Paul describes uh, one of the spiritual gifts and some of the misconceptions around it. I'm speaking about a gift of healing or healings. In, in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 28, it's, it's actually better translated uh, in, in the original language, Greek, instead of gift, it's gifts of healings. Evidently, Paul didn't envision that a person would be empowered with one good operating all the time for any, any illness that would happen in all diseases. I wish it was the case, because if that was the case, all the hospitals would be, would be empty. When, we're, when we pray for the sick at the end of a meeting, or we pray for one another, I believe we're all on the same level playing field. And that's why we encourage people to pray for one another, because God may give out one of those gifts right when we're praying for one another. Right when, when something is about to happen, he, he bestows a gift on you. It might be faith that is stirred in you where you see something take place, something internal or external. We're talked about in the book of Acts uh, concerning the gift of, of speaking in tongues. 
they, they learned a language. They were given a language they had never learned before. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul mentions tongues of men and of angels. There are heavenly language. Some Pentecostal and charismatic churches in their background have taught that speaking in tongues was the only evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe there are other signs as well. It's that power to witness, to see someone converted. It is that experiencing from the Lord uh, of, of maybe healings or a word of prophecy or a word of knowledge or wisdom or the working of a, of a miracle in your life that God empowers you where you are no longer the same person. Something happens in your life where you are changed. Paul's asking the question in these chapters in 1 Corinthians 12 through 13, through 14, are all prophets, or are all, do all interpret, do all speak in tongues, and he's doing it rhetorically, and the answer to the question is no. God gives gifts, different gifts to different people for the edification of the body. I, I pray in tongues every day, and I do that, the scripture says, for personal Edification, you say, so you want to be personally edified? The answer to the question is yes. Just like I want to be personally edified when I come here individually and corporately as a church, I'm edified by the preaching, I'm edified by the worship, I'm edified by the relationships that are here. And we pray for a continuing filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives all the time. I do. And I know many of you do. We're continually seeking more of God's presence within our lives. And if you are seeking a gift or gifts, uh, let me have, give you a, a few suggestions. Persevere in prayer. Paul exhorts uh, to us earnestly to the desire to give. He intends us to ask God for what is in our hearts that we're desiring. And don't be ashamed of wanting that gift. And don't be discouraged if the answer doesn't come as quickly as you would like. Secondly, don't be consumed with what you don't have. Be grateful for what God has already given you. Don't, the enemy always wants to tell us what we're not about as opposed to whose we are. Next is to devote yourself to extended periods of praise, worship. Set aside time in a place where you can be alone with the Lord. We live interrupted lives constantly. Someone's over either at our attention or we are bombarded by our devices. It's, it's quite a gift to be able to get by yourself and in this case to seek the Lord, opening your heart and opening your mouth and singing forth songs that God would put in you that might be different than anything you've ever experienced before. 1 Corinthians 13, 1, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I'm a, zong, a, a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Without love, tongues or other gifts are bothersome, they're annoying, they're abrasive, but with love they become a powerful, beautiful testimony of what the Spirit speaks of his gracious, gracious edifying of his work in our lives. Gifting is never, never above integrity. If people have a great amount of gifting and they have to use this gifting, but there's not integrity in their life, there's not accountability in their life, stay away from them. That's for the edification of themselves, not for the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit doesn't baptize anyone. It's Jesus who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit and with the Holy Spirit. The analogy of the water baptism that we experienced just a couple of weeks ago, uh, of when that person is immersed in the water representing the grave, we have been immersed in the Holy Spirit. We have been saturated with his Holy Spirit. We have been submerged with him, and we enjoy his presence and his power. I believe all Christians are baptized in the Spirit at the moment of their new birth. People much wiser and smarter than I am could uh, argue a different point. Yet the New Testament encourages multiple subsequent experiences of the Spirit and power of His presence. Spirit filling is described 
describing our continuous, ongoing experience and use of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In no, te- in no New Testament text are we, are we commanded to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, but on the other hand, we are com- commanded to be filled with the Spirit, as it mentions in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Here's what I've found about the use of the Holy Spirit in my life, and I'm sure many of yours as well. When God uses us in one of these gifts of the Holy Spirit, as well as other times, we, we now become part of that person's story. We're, that story that we're now engaged in with that person or persons that we are praying for or we are interceding for, and in a glorious way, we are now connected with them because of the common good that is going out to those that we're ministering. It's not for the person with the gift, it's to the expression of the body. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, Paul is speaking to Timothy in this letter. Timothy was the lead pastor at the Ephesus church. And he says this, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. Now, we don't worship prophecies. We don't memorize prophecies. We bring them to our mind, but what we memorize is the Word of God. The Word of God is what what holds us. These gifts are, are in accordance to the Word of God. But we don't receive things so that we worship them. And when the Word came to Timothy, it doesn't, Paul doesn't mention uh, exactly what that was, but Timothy knew what he was talking about. Maybe it was a, it was a vision, or maybe it had, had to do with a dream someone had that shared with, uh, with Timothy. Uh, It could have been given at his ordination when he was giving his life to the life of ministry. We know that it was life-changing, so much so that Paul encouraged him, rehearse that again in your mind, because it will give you strength and it will give you encouragement for the days ahead. When my parents immigrated to this country and lived in the Bronx in New York and and they were gloriously converted. And when I was to come into this world, I have three older sisters, when I was to come into this world, uh, the doctors said to my mom and dad that there were complications that, that uh, in order to save my mother's life, they wanted to abort this child. My dad didn't know what to do, so he went to the pastors of that little local Pentecostal church. And through prayer, a prophetic word came, actually referencing my life, that God was going to use me one day to preach the gospel of this child. I've rehearsed that word many times over 46 years or more of ministry. When we were thinking of changes that were going on to come in, in our life and ministry when Audrey and I were living in the country of Texas. Uh, you heard that right. Um, and we came here for, for a, a time of waiting upon the Lord and, and special meetings that were going on. A prophetic word came to us that confirmed what was to go on in our lives that we were getting ready to move and getting ready to change. And um, we lived out that word by obeying that as a witness of the Holy Spirit and a confirmation that came through that prophecy. And I've rehearsed that many times over to give me strength within our lives. There was a free-spirited brother that became connected to the life of our church and his name is Sam Poe. Do any of you remember the name Sam Poe? Several of you. Well, Sam was connected 
to our church, and I say free-spirited, he was really uh, very prophetic, and I would have, do not have a hesitation in calling him a prophet in it with a New Testament uh, definition of that. And so he was with us for a, a period of time as we were going through times of, of transition, and, and uh, he was a, a, wasn't an elder in the church, but was part of our, our team, and because, like I said, he was free-spirited. He was here, he was there, he was everywhere. Um, actually, uh, one of his sons, Andy, and his wife, Erin, are a part of the church and actually was able to pray with them this morning in the first service. And Sam was getting ready to leave. He had been a missionary in Mexico, and he was getting ready to leave to go back to Mexico. And the elders were praying for him in Phil's office. And... Um, one of the elders said, as we were praying for him, be on the lookout for a man named Bill. Or could the Lord be bringing someone into your life? Those, that kind of wording uh, named Bill. In a period of time, as he went back to Mexico, he did meet somebody named Bill. Bill and his wife, Sue. Bill and Sue Yarborough. In a period of time, that relationship grew and um, by other factors, and Bill's oldest daughter came back to the States and went to school at Christian Fellowship School, and her name is Ellie. Her, uh, and Ellie married Brett Barton. Her sister, Ellie's sister, Audrey, married David Boyd. And we've enjoyed those families who have brought us not only through these young ladies' experience in worship and their gifting, but those, all those families. You see, what was that word about? For the common good of all. We just didn't know how much that all was. But it has affected us and many other families um, I'm going to ask the worship team to, to come back, if you would, please, and uh, Nadia, if you would come as well. Uh, as they come back, I, I want to just give a little bit of a, a backdrop, but before I do, I don't want to forget this as well. Thank you, Phil. Um, when I was thinking about retiring and not knowing the timing of that, I had asked several people to pray about that. And one of them was Rick and Bernie Harris. They're in our 9 o'clock meeting. They can be seen every Sunday arguing on how many seats to save in their row. Um, Bernie's normally right. Um, she's the accountant. He's the salesman. And that couple, I asked them, would you, would you pray with me about this? And several years ago now, it was pro probably in 2012, when I was thinking this was the time, Bernie came to me after a service and she said, the Lord um, gave me a dream and you were in that dream. And she says, I think it's about some of the things you're wanting to, um, you've been praying about. And in that dream, she said, I was holding suitcases and I was waiting at a train station. And she said, and she says, I just want to tell you the train's not coming. It's not coming. You're not supposed to leave now. I've rehearsed that in my mind. I shared it with others. And it helped to discern the timing of the transition of leadership that took place then in, in 2015 and continues to take place, to take place now. That was just, so, here, here's a little something for you to think about. And it was life-changing for me. Now, I've asked Nadia here because I, during the class on the gifts of the Spirit that we had back in, in March, we left time in a couple of the classes to, for people to share different things that God had, that they thought God was showing them. And uh, it wasn't, thus says the Lord, or you got to speak in King James English, but they were just this casual I believe the Lord could be saying this. What do you think about this? And so different people shared. And uh, so that was back in March. Now, a backdrop is 
a year and a half ago, I would think that's the time frame, about a year and a half ago, we were on a, here on a Friday night, and I was praying for the worship team that was up here, and as I was praying for them, I noticed Nadia sitting in her assigned Friday night seat, which is over there, uh, and the phrase came to me uh, on this Friday night, your two years of winter are over. Now, jumping back to this March, we were concluding one of those classes, and as I said, different people were sharing, and when, uh, and all those things are kind of stirring in my mind during those several weeks, you know, when I was doing the class, and at the end of that, after people share, I, I said to Nadia, I said, I feel um, that God has, may have put something on my heart for you, and would you like for me to share it in public or private? And she started to cry. So as the discerning father that I am, I took that as let's do it privately. <laughs> so I asked a couple of her friends to sit with us, and I shared with her this phrase, your two years of winter are over. And so I'd like her to finish this up with her story. My name is Nadia. I've been a member of Christian Fellowship for about 10 years, and this is a story of how Dan cleaned up my mess. <laughs> um, so this was actually May 12th that I was at this class, and um, like you said, we were talking about prophecy, and he's like, you know, let's just practice. Put and that see a little if... closer to your mouth. Oh, sorry. Um, let's like practice and see if we receive anything from God, and, you know, that's how it all came about, and the word was, um, the winter that you've been in for the past two years is over for you. It's spring for you now, um, and so at that point, you know, you're okay until someone asks how you're doing, and then all of a sudden, you're crying, <laughs> so generally, I thought, you know, if you asked me, like, how long have you been having a hard time, I would have said, you know, two years, and then I came home, and I was like, and I wonder if that is specifically two years of something like exactly occurred. So I looked through my journal and so this was May 12th. So actually on May 11th of 2017, so exactly two years, um, an event occurred that I would describe that like left a pervasive feeling of anguish. And I think that feeling lasted about six months to a year, but it's been hard for about two years. Um, and so if I could describe what a winter of the soul feels like, it's the you've watched Lord of the Rings and Frodo Baggins is going through Mordor and every scene in there is like dark and gray and brown um, and you you get so overwhelmed by all of the brownness that like you know when they show you know the elves in their in their glory you know in the sun you're like oh finally like that was a really heavy scene but I feel like people who are going through winter you know that that Mordor doesn't change for them it might be springs but you don't actually feel that so when um, Dan shared that with me, uh, there's four points that really encouraged me by it. And one is I feel like I needed permission from God to not be faithful to my old emotions. Um, I feel a need to, like, for me to be a real person, for me to really bond with the feelings that I'm feeling. Um, so it was good that God was like, you don't have, like, you don't owe anything to those emotions anymore. Um, two, I felt validated actually by God that it was hard <laughs> and that God called it winter um, and that what I felt was real um, because sometimes I felt a little guilty, like am I overreacting, am I holding on to this too long? And so I was just glad that, you know, God, that God called it winter. Um, and the third was that God had set the time for the season, um, two years and no more. And even though I didn't remember that it had been exactly two years, he remembered. Hmm. And um, four, that it encourages me that God is with me in this new season and that he knows my heart. Amen. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it's for the common good. It's the common good of of all of us. I think people experience in the atmosphere of Christian Fellowship Church the reality of God's presence and His Spirit. They may not know how to word that. They may not know how to figure that all out and they'll come again or they'll, they'll be invited to dinner with someone or they'll feel a sense of love. And I, I'm, I'm not elevating our church in pride. I'm just grateful I'm a part of that experience. Experience. There's a lot of wonderful churches 
in Columbia. I'm grateful to be a part of this one. Let's stand. That concludes this week's message. We invite you to check us out at christianfellowship.com.